us get this party started. So welcome, my name is Anna Rakoxi. I'm the founder of Homemade Method and I'm joined today by Darlene Burgess, our Life Changing Cooking Program member. And today we're going to be talking to you all about cooking for fussy eaters or a meat and potatoes husband. So everyone who's just jumping in, say your name, where you're calling in from, if you're a current member, a graduate member. Hi Angel, hi Dale, hi Donna, hi Christine. Uh, welcome, Anita. It's so nice to have you join us. Bonnie, Deb, Carol, Tatia, um, Deb. Lovely, lovely to have you all here. So this is going to be an issue that many of you can relate to. And no matter what your starting point, I'm sure there'll be something you can take away from this workshop today. So this is for you if you want to eat healthier and you know that's your pathway to losing weight, keeping it off and bringing your blood numbers down, but you've tried to eat healthier in the past and sometimes you just don't like some of the food or you know you don't like some of the food. And it's for you if you've got a husband, kids or grandkids who aren't willing to try the healthier stuff that you're trying to cook. I know how demoralizing that can be. Or if you're sick and tired of trying to prepare two meals every night and you wish you could get everyone eating the same thing. So this event is part of our Success Mastermind series. That's the continuing support program we offer to our graduate members of our Life Changing Cooking program. It's also open to all our Life Changing Cooking program members. We do these events every month. We feature a member. Um, we pick an issue that a lot of you might be struggling with, something that we think adds a lot of value that we hear about a lot. So reach out anytime and ask for an issue if you want us to cover it and we'll do our best to cover it. And today I, we decided to open this event up to family and friends and our community because we actually did this event last week and I forgot to record it. So I thought if we're going to do it for round two, let's open it up and give you all a chance to watch it. And I was so happy to do it as well because I know a lot of you missed it last week. So the format for today is going to be we're going to begin with Darlene sharing her challenges and I'm going to invite you all to share your challenges in the chat. We're going to introduce Darlene, hear her story. She's amazing. She's such an inspiration. So I'm doubly excited to give her the opportunity to share her story with you all today. Um, and then we're going to share our best tips. And Darlene actually has some amazing tips that she's used to get over fussy eating in her family or with herself trying to eat more healthy. Um, Darlene has already lost 37 pounds since, um, I believe since you started our program and you'd lost about 10 before you started. And she's also brought her blood numbers down from as high as 289, her blood sugars to the low hundreds. So she's on her way, she's not stopping. And her story is amazing, excited to share that with you. Then I'm gonna go into sharing my best tips. I've got five best tips to share with you today to help you with this challenge. If you wanna eat healthier, you wanna lose weight without dieting and you wanna get your family eating all your food. Um, and then we'll do Q&A at the end if we have time. So this event, last time we managed to stick to the hour. Today, there's a lot more of us on and with the Q&A, it could go for 90 minutes. If you need to go sooner, just hop off. There will be a replay sent out to everybody. Um, and that's about it. So I'm gonna dive straight into content. Um, one last thing is the program we're talking about today um, that I'll be mentioning throughout the session. It's our life changing cooking program. And we're actually opening up the wait list for enrollment to our January program in the next few days. So if you've been wanting to, if you've been hearing what this is all about, you've been wanting to get in, then jump on that wait list. I checked it this morning. There's about 1170 people on the wait list and we're only offering about 300 spots are left because we've been also opening up the spots to people in our workshops. And we do that because my attitude is if you can't show up to a workshop, then maybe you're not that committed to yourself. And at the end of the day, you're the only person who can make these changes. Everyone who comes in and shares these amazing stories of transformation, I always say, I'm so proud of you because you're the one who did it. So sometimes we offer enrollments to people in our workshops, but I also want to give people the chance who haven't been able to attend. And this is the first time we're opening enrollment to our list in a year. And I'm not sure when we'll open enrollment again. So if that's you, the waitlist URL, um, Maddie, if you could type it in, it's... Um, life-changing.homemade-cooking.com and it's in your emails. That's the wait list coming to you soon. So without further delay, welcome ladies. I'm going to introduce Darlene and let's get this party started. So Darlene, um, I loved, loved so much chatting to you in our first session. I left, I was so excited 
And when I realized I hadn't recorded, I was kicking myself big time because I thought everyone needs to hear your story. So if you could just start by introducing yourself, um, who you live with, who you're cooking for, um, and maybe let's start there. Okay, I'm Darlene Burgess. I'm from North Georgia. Um, my two grandsons have been living with me and they are uh, four and eight, just turned eight. And we've just been working away. That's amazing. And so you, obviously you joined the program and tell us a little bit about why you joined the program. Well, I had been so discouraged and I got to where I just said, I'm not doing any more diet because the only time I gained weight was when I dieted. I would lose 15, 20 pounds. And then that 15 or 20 pounds would come back with 20 pounds more of its friends and move in. And I could just kept heavier and heavier. When I listened to a workshop that you did or a webinar that you did, you just kind of got in my head and flipped on some switches and everything you made just resonated with me to the point of, well, okay, there is a way out of this. And it just, a lot of things that had never clicked before clicked. That's fantastic. So, and, um, and so can you share a little bit more? I just loved hearing last time about what it was that clicked, like what changed for you? You know, you dieted and lost the weight and always gained it back and then some. And that was my story for my whole life. When I used to diet and struggle with my eating, I'd always control it, try the newest thing, you know, use all my discipline and willpower and follow the plan. And then somehow, for some reason, the wheels would fall off. I'd find myself binge eating the foods I've been trying to avoid, or I'd just lose my focus, lose my discipline. And I'd feel so ashamed and I'd feel so alone. I always thought it was just me. I, everyone else seemed to be managing and it was just me. And I thought, why can't I do this? Um, so what changed for you in what you heard from me or from homemade? What, what was that light bulb that went off in case it helps anyone else who's listening? Well, first off, I didn't need to eat everything at one time. That I could space it out. I could wait five minutes. I could do something else. So that clicked. The other thing was watching the part where you were showing how diets fail us miserably. Mm -hmm. That how you could go on the diet and you were good and good and good for a few days. And then, like you said, the wheels fall off because you've deprived yourself of all these calories. It's too much, too fast. And you end up eating more calories afterwards. In two weeks' time, you end up replacing it. But you've trashed your, met met your metabolic system. And so with your metabolism slowed, of course, things are going to put on more weight more quickly. And so that kind of was for me the thing that it was like this aha moment of, okay, I don't eat everything at once and I can't take it off all at one time. Every time I've tried, mm -hmm. it's come back with more. Why don't I just chill out? Because the fact of the matter is in five years, I'm going to be five years older. The question is, am I going to be any lighter? because I've either tried to change this into a diet and failed, or am I just going to take it slow? Am I going to allow my body to reabsorb the extra skin? Or am I going to be needing plastic surgery because I've lost it all real fast? Or more likely, I'm just going to go off it. It'll be another failed diet. But if I take it slowly and focus on, first off, my first focus was to get my, my blood sugar levels down. My second focus was to get to feeling better and get my arthritis under control. And the goal was not weight loss. It was yeah. getting myself, eating a more healthy way, getting my, my blood sugar, because that's the only one that was skewed. My, every, all my other labs are great. They're fantastic. But that blood sugar was out of control. Yeah. And so I can diet. I just, you know, I can diet control, meaning I can be mindful of what I'm eating and bring my sugars down. And by eating the way that you found for us to eat, I can eat more whole grain carbs and still do better. Yeah. So I love, I love hearing you speak, Darlene, because I just think I resonate so much with what you're saying, which is really absorbing what we try and teach, which is that you can get healthy and achieve your weight goals without going on a diet. In fact, diets have never served us focus on getting healthy, focus on your goals and do it slowly and it will happen. So I love that. And um, I do want to get into the content, but if you could quickly share um, the story you told about, um, I loved hearing that story too the other day when you were saying how 
you were having a bad day and you called your daughter, was it? And you said, I want to go eat chips and ice cream. And then what happened? Maybe share that with us. I love that story too. I had Alexander's very horrible, terrible day. I came home. I was tired. I was frustrated. I didn't want to fix anything. Got on Facebook with the open window to my daughter said, you know, right now I want a bag of Hershey's chocolate minis. I want a, a bag of chips, a tub of dip and a half gallon of ice cream, Rocky Road. And then I went in the kitchen and I fixed a big salad and I ate it. Yes. <laughs> and, then, and, and I wasn't craving the other stuff. And what was the mentality? Because I can tell you, like, when I used to binge eat, it would be a bag of chips, ice cream and candy. That was generally the trio and big servings of them, you know, huge amounts of them. And, <laughs> and I don't the whole bags, all of it. Either. I've finally found freedom from that. It never happens anymore with this approach. So tell everyone what happened in your head. Like you had the impulse to go and do that. And how did you get to making a salad? What did you think to yourself to have a different outcome? Okay, this is fine. But do you really want to throw everything away you've been working on and go back to what you were? Or do you want to continue doing this? In other words, I had to tell the little kid going off in my mind, I want this and, and pitching on the floor tantrum. And going, mm, nope, this is what we're having. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, when you think about it, that there's this kid that you need to parent inside of you and go, no, that's not the best thing for us. If we still want some later, I know where some candy is hidden. It is the boys' exactly. Christmas candy. I can have it. But, and by the time I was done eating the salad and it settled down, I wasn't craving it anymore. It was just, it was stress eating and not, I mean, I was hungry, but it wasn't. I wasn't fulfilling hunger. I was eating out of stress. And yeah. so I went in and made the salad, took care of the hunger. The stress left because, well, mm -hmm. I was hungry. That, mm -hmm. you know, so I ate something healthy and wise. salvaged what could have been. Wise yeah, wise words here. And that's what it takes. That minute that the urge to binge takes hold, realize if it's stress or hunger. If it's hunger, go and eat something. If it's stress, realize that it's not really going to help and just do what you can to get back on track. And there's various strategies. We'll cover them another time. We do have a whole video on binge eating, but now don't keep us in suspense any longer. Tell us what results you've achieved so far um, through your program. Well, I went from, when I joined the, the program, I'd lost 10 pounds and I brought my blood, blood sugar from 289 down to about, I think it was 172, somewhere around in there. Since then, which is October, middle of October, my blood sugars were running lower till my PT stopped. And I, you know, it was exercise I was getting. And so I have to adjust and figure out something else to do. Um, but my, my blood sugars are now running steadily in the low 100s. It's been as low as 75. After Thanksgiving and Christmas, they were in the mid 80s. Um, and that was those meals. My weight has gone as of this week because I lost another pound and have kept it off for about a week before I, I count it as being gone. Um, I'm down uh, 37 pounds. Woohoo! So, so <laughs> this is where I, I'm so proud of you and so excited for you. Um, so everybody, I'd love you to comment in the chat some praise, congratulations, encouragement for Darlene. She's lost 37 pounds so far and got her blood sugars down from 289 to the 80s, the low hundreds. So that is so incredible. And what I love as well, she said to me um, last time that, you know, I still want to lose another 100 or 150 pounds and I'm going to take five years to get there. And that is the way to do it because she will never gain the weight back if she does it like that. So awesome. So I'm seeing tons of congratulations. Wow, way to go. You inspire me. You go, girl. Way to go. That's amazing. Awesome. Keep up the good work. Congratulations. Congratulations. Way to go. Love how you parented yourself. Yes, Brenda, that's part of the message for today. Way to go, darling. You go, girl. Congratulations. Congratulations. Woohoo. Fantastic. All right. So turning now to your challenges with fussy eating, share with us where you started from in terms of all these healthy foods and superfoods, what were the ones that you struggled with or didn't really like? Um, let's start there. What have been some of your challenges and continuing challenges? Um, I can't eat chicken after it's been cooked and cooled for whatever reason. It makes me sick to my stomach. I don't eat fish when I was young. I used to go fishing, bring home the fish. My mother would cook it. I'd get bones in my mouth or I'd choke on them. 
the fish is a no-go unless I pour enough stuff on it. It's no point eating fish because it's no longer healthy. Um, there are some of the vegetables that I don't particularly care for. I've had uh, mostly beets and Brussels sprouts and um, kale, and I've just found workarounds for those. Great. Okay. So I want to call on everyone who's in the chat here. Um, comment on what are some of your fussy eating challenges, whether it's you or your husband, kids or grandkids, just type in the chat some of the foods that you know you should eat or you want to eat, but you just don't like them. And we'll see if we can cover as many of them as we can today. Um, and while you're doing that, Let's see. So we've got beets from Angel. I already knew that, Angel. Oh, Laurie, hello. Welcome. Uh, doesn't like vegetables. Um, onion or garlic, says Bev. Hey, kale, says Lee. Beets, beets, fish, Brussels sprouts, beets, collards, kale, beets for some reason, can't eat them. Fish, says Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. Jean, welcome, Jean. Hi, Carol. Um, meat and potatoes, husband. She loves veggies, all kind. Beets, Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprouts, beets. Eggplant, meat and potato, husband, beets and fish. Um, and if you have a husband, get specific about what he will or will not eat. Someone said avocado is not my friend. Beets, Brussels sprouts, fish, cold poultry, raw kale, um, any veg except cauliflower and kale. Okay. Husband doesn't eat garlic. Here we go. Fish, most green vegetables. All right. This is good. We have actually, it's fascinating. There's such a big overlap on what people don't like. The beets and eggplant coming up a lot. What about cilantro? Do people like cilantro? That used to be the one thing I didn't like. Um, we've got raw kale. Oh, <laughs> husband says eating kale reminds him of eating plastic. Loves cilantro, says... Oh, everyone loves cilantro. Okay, there you go. No cilantro, says Mary Lou. No cilantro. Husband hates chicken. Can handle... Yeah, I think it tastes like soap too, Diane, but I've grown to love it. Um, husband hates anything healthy. Uh, hate cilantro tastes like soap. <laughs> I think so too, but I, I've grown to love it now. So quinoa says it's, has, Rose quinoa says, husband says it's like bird seed. I can see that. Um, okay. What else? Anything else? Oh, eggs and oatmeal says Keisha. Um, garlic, quinoa. All right. So you can keep typing those in. And now I want to hear from you, Darlene, um, any family member stories about, you know, your grandkids or your father about fussy fussiness. Yeah. My dad was a very fussy eater. He had only um, been able to eat whatever was grown on his family's farm. And so he would only eat about eight or 10 things. And my mother one time, sneaked in, was, had been sneaking in some onion powder and garlic powder into his, um, into the, the roast she made every week, into the water. She didn't put it directly, but she put it in the water. And one time he had come in and saw it and started complaining. She told him to shut up. She'd been doing it for 20 years and he liked it that way. And, you know, so that was about, but he was a very, very, because he had a very, he had a palate that was quite <laughs> able to taste, um, foods and, and taste texture differences mm -hmm. oh nice i'm getting some interesting ones in um patty with corn um bunny says eggplant and linda says lentils um that's a great story darlene and i actually can relate my husband would do the same thing to my mother sometimes criticize her cooking and she'd go i've been cooking it this way for 20 years this is how we're gonna eat it so um and you've liked it that way pretty funny but yeah. yes do have a limited palate so that can be a big challenge especially if you're trying to make changes cabbages come up a few times too let me make a note we'll try and cover these today some of these extra ones um cabbage quinoa uh eggplant all right i saw someone wrote oh we've got lentils coming in someone wrote pork as well um and chicken has come up a bit okay so I'm going to go start talking about the tips um, that I've talked about. But before I do, um, Darlene, do you want to say, share some of your tips of what you've um, come up with to be able to incorporate these healthy foods into your way of eating to, to get these results? So how have you changed the way you ate since you started the program? What have been the big changes? Can you do me a favor? Can we jump to something else? My phone sent out an emergency message to my daughter that I was in trouble and she can't get hold of me. She thinks that there's something wrong. Oh, Let me no. get her real 
Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, I'll begin my tips and then we'll also get Darlene to share her tips and then um and then we'll also do QA at the end. So I wanted to begin by saying that um You've got to have an open mind to get the most out of this. And that applies not just to this workshop, but to everything you'll hear in the program, in our community, and in general, in your life. If you come into this um, with, the, with a closed mind going, this isn't going to work, I don't like this, that tip wouldn't work for me, then you can leave and get nothing out of it. And that's fine. But then you won't get the most out of it, you can. So my suggestion is have an open mind, knowing that not everything I share with you is going to work for you. But even if one or two things that I or another member shares today, click something in your head and you go, I could try that. Maybe that would work for me. Then that's a win for you. That's how change happens. Change isn't everything. Nothing's going to be perfect. It's not overnight. It's little piecemeal pieces. So have an open mind. And so Darlene, are you done with the text? Is the yes, yes. I let her know to keep from sending the police here. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, I'm glad you dealt with that. <laughs> so um, do you have any tips on Maybe if you could start by sharing, you know, how was your eating when you started and what changes have you made? And especially when it came to picky eating, how have you been able to incorporate more healthy foods into what you eat? Well, I've learned to sneak things in. I have oh, I found that. that when I put um, stuff in the blender with my smoothie, like kale, that creepy, I'll eat it if I go through and toast it and whatever. If I just try eating it plain or boiling it, it doesn't get done. But I found that if I put the greens in with the smoothie, A, I don't have to do something else with them, like cook them down for a while. And B, I can't really taste them because the mm -hmm. other things, the bananas and the fruit and the other vegetables covers the taste up. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that if I use some of our friend, raw cacao, it makes anything palatable, you know, it puts a little chocolate flavor to it. Yep. Um, some of the other foods, uh, somebody suggested at the last webinar, and I happened to have gone to the store because I needed some salad fixings and found a tub of um, Brussels sprouts that not only to roast them, but when I put the olive oil, if I sprinkle a little balsamic vinegar on, mm -hmm. that and the fact that they were really, really fresh, I didn't let them sit around for a couple of days before I fixed them, they really weren't bad. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised. Um, some of the stuff, I was always a raw vegetable eater when I was a kid, to the point my mom took me to the doctor, she thought there was something wrong with me. Um, and so there's some of these, I think that if I use raw and either mix it in the, bl the blender, and I just have a run of the mill ostrich, it's not a super blender, mm -hmm. that, I, that it's okay and I like it. And mm -hmm. so, and then with my kids one time, they were, my grandkids, they were balking on eating some soup I had made. So I took the stick blender, made it creamy, um, ground up all the vegetables and, and uh, beans or whatever I had in it, and then went ahead and changed the flavoring, the, the spices a little bit in it. And they ate it. And they asked for a second bowl. So it was That's evidently true. the texture that, that was bothering them some. So sometimes I found that if I cook it a different way, it changes the texture, and then I can eat it. That's brilliant. You, that's See, Darlene's just covered half the things I was going to share with you today. That's why she's such a great member to have on here. Fantastic tips. So I'm going to share some of my tips now and keep typing in the chat. It's great seeing all your comments. You can help each other that way too and engage that way. I won't be able to read everything out, but I'll try and keep sneaking a peek at it. So if I miss you, um, just keep typing in. All right. So my first number one tip is actually about mindset. And I've had so many members say to me, mindset is everything when it comes to getting healthy and losing weight in a way that's sustainable and not with the old dieting mentality that we're trying to get rid of. And that's why we have an entire portion of the program dedicated to mindset because many of us women have spent our entire life dieting and restricting what we eat. And so we have that dieting mindset so ingrained in us. And so it's learning this new way of eating for nourishment and satisfaction. So when it comes to fussy eating, my tip here is you've got to set an intention. And yes, the mindset is everything. I agree, Bev. I've just heard this from so many members who succeed. Um, it's that shift in your brain. And it's that shift that Darlene was talking about where it's not about the pounds anymore. It's about getting healthy and having a good quality of life going ahead. It's about keeping up with your grandkids. 
It's about reducing the arthritic pain, reversing the inflammation, getting the blood numbers down, getting off the medications. And then you do start to feel good when your clothes fit looser, right? It is a good feeling when you feel better and more mobile. So that's the mindset bit. So when it comes to fussy eating, um, I always re re remind my members to come back to your big why. And this is why we start the Success Graduate Program talking about your big why, because I think that's the thing you can come back to when things go wrong, which they will, when things are hard, which they will be hard, um, you come back to that big why. So the big why is, again, it's not about wearing nice jeans. It's, I really want to be alive for my grandkids. I want to be there when my grandkids graduate. Or it's, I want to be able to walk up a mountain with my husband in our retirement and not be puffing or not be using my cane. So it's a really deep why that moves you, that powers you. So set that intention because changing habits isn't always easy and there's going to be tough times. Um, so set that intention for yourself. Now, if you're the fussy eater, three quick tips to bear in mind. Tip number one is, again, mirroring what Darlene said. Um, I say, don't be a five-year-old. And by that, I mean, we all have that little person inside who wants to eat chocolate cake all day and wants to eat the whole tub of ice cream in front of the TV. And... We don't let our kids or grandkids do that. So we probably shouldn't let ourselves do that. And so the tip is just be a mother to yourself rather than a five-year-old. As a mother to yourself, you're caring, you're nurturing, you're not judging, you're loving, but you can say no to yourself sometimes and it's not the end of the world. As Darlene said, the shift with the homemade approach and the homemade program is no food is off limits forever. So yes, you can have chocolate cake anytime. You can have ice cream anytime, which means you don't need to eat the whole thing because you're not guilty or bad or breaking your diet if you have it. Just have a little bit and then put it away or don't have it every night. So be a mother, not a five-year-old. Next correlated tip if you're the person who's the fussy eater also is don't be a princess either. And by that, I mean not every meal has to taste amazing and you know, I'm, all of my members know I'm the hugest advocate. A core part of our philosophy is eat for nourishment and satisfaction. And the satisfaction bit is the bit that's different to dieting, which is that I want you to make your food taste good. I want you to look forward to it. But at the same token, if we're trying to get healthy, not every meal has to taste amazing. Not every meal has to be something that you want to write home about. So sometimes I do eat meals that are more nourishing and more healthy rather than very tasty and it's more functional nutrition it's stuff that my body needs and so part of your mentality if you're fussy can be okay not every meal has to taste amazing some of the stuff i eat um is just going to be good for me and that's okay that's not a problem right so setting that mindset that the end result is worth it if you think about things like brushing your teeth or taking a shower or flossing your teeth they're not all that enjoyable all the time but we do it because it's good for us. And so to some extent, eating these healthy foods, you can set that intention of don't be a princess. Some of the stuff won't taste that good. Now, by the same token, don't be a martyr either. I don't want you eating stuff that you hate all the time because then you'll never be able to stick to it. So I want you to think about most of the foods you eat, most of the ingredients you eat, and most of the meals you have should be delicious to you. So for example, maybe four out of five days, I make smoothies that are delicious one out of five days i make smoothies that are just good for me and they're packed with spinach kale carrot cucumber they don't look great they're thick and sludgy and they separate and i just drink it down because i know my body needs it so think of it that way that's if you're the fussy eater now next part is what if your husband or a loved one is a fussy eater you can't set their intention but here's a little trick that you can do is talk to their values Try to bring their values up by you know them better than anyone in the world. So figure out what their values are and see if you can enlist their values to get them eating in this way. And you can do it in tricky ways. So one example is if you have a husband who's very money conscious or budget conscious, then you can sit him down to his meal and go, oh, I got this five pound bag of beets for $2.50. This, um, this whole meal is only $2.25 a serve. That might make him excited to eat that meal. Another example, I know my family has always been very frugal, very um, budget conscious. So that would totally work a little bit on my family. It's not going to get you all the way, but it might help. Some other values that you could use is not wasting food. 
So if your um, if your family grew up in the era of don't leave anything on your plate, which was my grandfather, then that's another example. Pop it on their plate and then they'll eat it if you're serving the food. Another example that I love actually is as women, often the men in our life just want to support us. And you know the saying, a happy, a happy wife is a happy life or whatever it is. Um, so you can actually call upon that value and say to them, look, I know you don't like this food. I'm not asking you to like it all the time but this is really important to me. This is why I'm doing this. And I would love you to support me. And this is how you can support me. And for a lot of men, they don't actually care as much about what they eat sometimes. And so that might be something where they're doing it to support you. That might be the value that you can tap into. For other men, it could be husbands. It could be talking about your vision of retirement. You could say, I really want to do this together so we can retire and be healthy and energetic and well for our retirement. Um, another example that I love is actually talking about the science. I saw one of the ladies commented in the chat earlier about what's the science behind this. There's a lot of science behind this and this is not the science behind our approach um, session. So if you want info on that, email us and we'll share it with you. But it's very scientifically based developed by a team of doctors and nutritionists. And so if your husband is scientifically minded like that, if he loves facts, I've had members say that they were listening to one of my workshops on diabetes and their husband walked into the kitchen and he just sat there and listened for the whole session to their surprise. And then after dinner, he started commenting on the fact that he was eating whole grains and vegetables on his plate and why and how they were good for him. And he complained the next day when he got bagels for breakfast because he said, isn't this the bad carbs that's going to mess with my blood sugars? So if that's your husband's values, talk to that. So maybe um, if you ladies would like to comment in the chat, if you think there's anything, this first tip around mindset, which is setting your intention or using values that might help you or work for you in your household um, with some of the challenges. So comment in the chat if there's anything in there. And for you, Darlene, um, what's been a thing that when it comes to the mindset, what do you think has been a mindset shift that's really helped you with this journey and to stick with it through the hard times? I just really, really wanted to get healthy. And I, this is the first time I really, really thought that I could. I used to be an athlete when I was a kid. Softball, football, basketball, baseball, volleyball if it was a ball to chase I was down the field with it and as I got older and you know we lived in a day and time where you know you were supposed to become a lady and being 20 something and still playing ball the guys aren't real interested in you and so I quit the sports and that's when I started gaining the weight because I was losing the exercise that I had been getting and mm -hmm. so it has been a struggle to get back with that to get back to doing you know, even those things that I could do um, for a long time, my knees were really bad. I have bad arthritis in them and some other damage in them. And so, you know, it's just been a process. And now I'm to the point where I can stand up and down without having to, to you know, hunch over and push off or hold on to something. I, it just, white, weird thing, my gray hair is turning light brown. I showed wow. him my grandson today Ooh, and wow. his jaw dropped and he said, your hair is going light brown. And I said, yes, it is. That's I was incredible. Shocked. Wow. You know, That's so amazing. there's nutrition getting there that can oh, yeah. actually back up damage that has been done. Wow. That's incredible. Well, I was going to say to you, um, when you were talking about the loose skin, that the entire body recreates itself every seven years. It's pretty incredible. Your entire skin regenerates, bones, um, practically all parts of our body, except certain parts of the brain, literally recreate themselves, um, blood, everything, your organs. And so mm -hmm. what do they make themselves out of? They make themselves out of the nourishment that we put in our bodies. Our bodies are literally made of what we eat. So I want to read out some of these excellent comments. Um, so the first one here, Deb, um, you said, your husband's mindset is healthy, is yucky and tasteless. I get that. So don't go at him with that. That's not going to work for him. Don't. I, I had an extra point on here saying, don't be preachy about healthy eating. Don't guilt, guilt them into it. Um, if you do, they're going to want to sabotage you. And also don't make a big deal about it. So if the healthy angle doesn't work with your husband, try something else. Try the, I want you to support me. Or um, I, we will save money this way. Or 
you know, I put in all this effort to make this for you. Whatever works, you know your husband better than anyone else. So comment if you can think of an angle that might work for your husband. Um, Bev says, my husband likes that I'm not throwing out unused produce anymore. I save, use everything. He appreciates that we're not wasting money. I love that one. And I personally resonate with that value so much. As you all know, who's in the program, that's such a big part of what I like to share is how you can use everything. It feels so good to completely clean out your fridge every week and not waste a thing. So that's a great one. Um, Clarissa, just email the, um, the member at homemade-cooking.com with your question about the diabetes session. Um, I love Penny's comment as well. She said, I need to be a mother to myself. I've allowed myself to eat whatever, whenever for too long. And Penny, I just want to say to you that I know I've gone through phases when I'm in that eat whatever, whenever mentality. It's always during some kind of rough patch when I don't have that energy to care for myself. And then the pounds always stack on. And there's often a delay. It can be two weeks, four weeks. But all of a sudden, I look at myself in the mirror and go, gosh, what, what happened there? And I remember then that time of the eating whatever, whenever for a while. But the good news is, this process of starting to be a mother, it does turn it around and you can do it in a beautiful, loving, non-judgmental, nurturing way like a mother and a true mother does give their child little treats now and then. So you can treat yourself so you don't have to be perfect. Um, Angel's saying her son and husband are super supportive. That's awesome. Love hearing about your Angel's 16 year old son has been cooking up a storm. Um, it sounds like he's taking over your kitchen, Angel. That's awesome. Um, Peggy says the mindset change is that the one thing I can do to help with my aneurysm is let go of some of my weight. I can't have surgery because it's not that bad yet, but it could still rupture. So less mate, weight means less stress on the aid or order. The correlation between being a healthy weight and reducing your risk for heart disease, aneurysms, um, strokes is absolutely massive. So you're so on point there, Peggy. And that is this commitment to being healthy and doing it for your health. So that's fantastic. All right. I'm not going to read them all out because there is a ton um, coming through, but they all look magnificent. So let's go on to tip number two. So tip number one is the mindset bit. It's about values and it's about intention. Um, tip number two is about retraining your palate. So this applies to absolutely everybody here, whether it's your husband, kids, grandkids, um, Darlene, when she started out, everybody. And the tip is basically that your palate literally gets used to what you eat all the time. So if you're used to eating 10 ingredients only, if you don't eat quinoa, beets, Brussels sprouts, fish, whatever it is, your, and more importantly, if you eat a lot of junk food, processed food, um, refined carbs and sugars, that's exactly what your body will crave. And so the good news is you can actually retrain your palate. And one of the most exciting, liberating things I hear from my members over and over again is how they are absolutely blown away that once you start cooking and eating this way, how quickly your palate will reset itself and how quickly the cravings start to reduce and disappear. So the two quick tips here to achieve that, it's pretty simple actually. Number one is you've got to actually reduce your exposure to fast food. And by that, I don't mean go cold turkey. I don't mean be perfect. And fast food, I want to include here candy, processed foods, junk food, really. It's junk food, not fast food. And by limit exposure, I don't mean go cold turkey. I don't mean quit everything and try and be perfect. That doesn't work anyway. I don't mean clear out your cupboard and make your husband uh, go on a, 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 what's it called? A, um, when people stop working, what's that word again? Um, uh, anyway, it will come to me. No, 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 not retiring. A strike. Rita got it. I kept wanting to say stroke and I was going, it's not a stroke, <laughs> but a strike. So if you suddenly clear out all the junk food from your household, whoever lives with you is not going to be happy. So that is not what I suggest. But do limit your exposure because the science shows Fast food companies, junk food companies, they literally use neuroscience and physiology of hunger and satiety to create foods with a bliss point that is perfect for your body's reward centers in the brain to trigger happiness and satisfaction. And the more you eat those foods, the more addictive they've become. So the research shows 
that junk food, fast food triggers the same reward centers in the brain as cocaine. So you can literally get addicted to junk food. And when you pit against that, a Brussels sprout or some kale, it's got no chance, <laughs> no chance there. So if you're trying to compete with, you know, burgers and fries or pizza or whatever those staple foods are, um, chips, candy, cookies, uh, if they're staples in your household, or even the pseudo healthy foods, the granola, the yogurt, the frozen yogurt, the, um, the protein bars, they're all just what I call junk food masquerading as health food. It's not the solution. It's part of the problem. Um, when you pit your poor Brussels sprouts against that, they can't win. And so the first tip is just try and reduce the exposure to the junk foods. It doesn't mean being perfect, but anywhere you can put more of the good stuff in, you will be winning not because you're saving on calories, you'll be winning because you're gradually retraining your palate. So buy just a smaller bag of crisps or chips. Or if you're going to buy the ice cream, buy the pint instead of the gallon and buy better quality ice cream and serve it, you know, in smaller bowls or buy just the chips instead of the chips and ice cream. So take it easy, but it will make a difference. If you eat fast food four times a week, just try and do it three times a week. It does make a difference. And over time, you're retraining your palate. The second part of this is the flip side of the coin is bringing more of the good stuff into your household. And so the more you can bring the good stuff in, even the stuff that your family already likes, even if it's carrots and tomatoes every single night with lettuce, um, bringing in more of the good stuff um, is the key to this palate reset process. So tip number two is super simple. It's that what you currently call fussy could just be the result of a palate that's been trained to like those foods. And it could be the result of having a palate that's addicted to the junk foods, the salt, fat, sugar, um, which they've scientifically engineered to be addictive. And the good news is you can reverse it by just retraining your palate, limit exposure to the bad stuff, bring in more of the good stuff, even if it's the good stuff they already like, and your palate will change over time. So on that note, I'm going to pause and say, Darlene, um, have you had this experience since you started your program of cravings changing or your palate changing at all? And if people want to type in the chat as well, existing members or, um, or new members, anyone who wants to share about, yeah, Joanna's saying I'm definitely addicted to the junk food. I cannot stress enough how much you can reverse that. It's actually mind blowing. And it gets to the point where I can now have a packet of crisps, or some candy in the cupboard and I don't eat the whole thing anymore. For years it was just, I just didn't keep it at home. As Darlene said the other day with the binge eating desire, she said to me, well, I also had to get in the car to go buy it and that was another barrier. And I used that barrier for a long time, but now I can actually have even candy or chips at home. I do it rarely, but when I do, I don't need to eat the whole thing in one go anymore because you can overcome that addiction to junk food. So I would say to retrain your palate, you can start noticing the difference in one or two weeks. And honestly, the complete retrain, I would say, can take three months, six months, two years. But it's a process. We're not trying to be perfect in one day. We're trying to just constantly move towards the goal. So loving seeing these shares. Darlene, do you have, do you, have you had any experience with your cravings changing or your palate changing since you started the program? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things I did when I was trying to get off the of junk food is I substituted things like um, unsalted, raw um, sunflower seeds or uh, pumpkin seeds because it required me to fiddle with it. Pomegranates mm -hmm. are also good, especially if you eat the whole, you crunch the whole thing up because they're real fiddly to get out. They keep your hands busy. They keep your mouth busy, but they don't have much in them. And so it kept that, that desire to gnaw something really. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it beat it off. And so that helped me get through like the first months. So by the time I got here, sometimes I was craving it. I just didn't know what to do. And then this program's helped me learn how to keep from sabotaging myself. It's given me that mindset that helps me not, not sabotage myself. That's great. And have, were you, would you say before you started the program, were you addicted to sugar and has that changed for you? Or were you mainly into the salty stuff or both? Um, let's put it this way.
Yeah, I'm ashamed to admit that most nights I was eating an entire like 13 ounce bag of Hershey miniatures and sometimes either chips or ice cream. And I don't mean a few, spoon, a few spoonfuls. I would eat an entire, what is it, a quart and a half or whatever they sell the ice cream as now. The bigger container, I would eat one of those, sometimes both of those in a single night. Which is why my blood sugar well, there is, is so high. No judgment here. Uh, I'm sure so many people who are on this chat right now can totally relate. Feel free to write, write if you can relate to that. But so how has that changed? Has, have you noticed any change to the actual craving? Because we started off with mm -hmm. setting the intention. But what I'm trying to say here with this second point is that you don't need to rely on the discipline and willpower. The intention mm -hmm. is important. But once you retrain your palate, it gets easier and easier. And I just want to hear if you've mm -hmm. had that experience that it gets easier because the cravings changed or your palate changed. Oh yeah, because the other day I totally would have would have caved in and gone out and gotten that mm -hmm. junk food and eaten it. Didn't mm -hmm. matter that I had to go someplace. I was just you know up to here, exasperated and tired and and whatever. And so the thing I have found is that even sometimes just during the regular day, my grandson I had left some of his candy out about four or five pieces of my favorite things to eat that he had gotten for Christmas, and I just put them up in a cabinet where I can't see. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it for a second, but I went. You know, it's the whole thing of, look how much progress you made. Do you want to sabotage yourself or not? Mm -hmm. That helps. Mm -hmm. I literally don't crave the chocolate because I've replaced the chocolate profile with the raw cacao. Mm -hmm. And then I found with you've used the coconut sugar, I can use half or less. Mm -hmm. or, or, yeah, so that you're having ha half of it or even less of the amount of sugar called for in something. It still serves. I no longer put it in my smoothies. I've been able to, you know, I kind of went forward and used some of these things. The cacao stays, but the coconut sugar and everything, I've just really backed off on. That's and so amazing. I'm not, I'm literally not craving it anymore. I'm actually craving a salad because I haven't had one in two days. I have yeah. to go to the store and haven't left the house because it's raining. So. It's so true. Also, I will say the more you start listening to your body, the interesting thing happens that you start craving the healthy things. So that example mm -hmm. I gave in the beginning of sometimes on the fifth day, I just eat the smoothie that's not delicious, but I'm just mm -hmm. having it because I know it's good for me. That's not driven by guilt. It's driven my, my, by my body saying, oh, you overdid it in the last few days with some inflammatory foods or some rich foods. And I need something like super high in fiber, super nourishing, super cleansing to just alkalize my body cleanse my body out, put me back on track, you know? So it's very much the more you listen to your body, the more you start craving the good things. So that's great. Let me read some of the comments. So Anne-Marie, welcome. She said, so true, I'm vegan-ish, having vegan days and vegetarian days. Um, I do have sugar cravings and don't have any junk food in my house. I told myself that if I want a sweetie, I have to go out and get it. Totally helps, doesn't it? Um, let's see, Jill. Um, Deb says, I agree that you can be addicted to sugar just like a drug. I truly feel I was, but homemade has helped me retrain my palate. It's not a problem now to stay away from it. That's amazing, Deb. So happy to hear it. Um, let's see. Debbie says, don't have the urge um, to eat sweets as I used to. Um, I think as well, ladies, doesn't it make a huge difference that you're not swearing off it? You're allowed to have it if you really, really want it and then make, mm -hmm. make the most of it. If you're going to have something sweet, make it amazing, make it delicious. Um, really enjoy it. And that makes a big difference to the mindset where it's not forever. You can really have it any time. And then you just decide whether or not you want to have it for your health, for that big why. So Anita says, husband used to fuss about not having snacks in the house when we first married. We have actually had ice cream go bad and tortilla chips go stale. Well, that's amazing, Anita. Um, wow. Sylvia says, now beets taste so sweet. Huge example of the, um, the palate reset. Um, someone said, yes, chips are my downfall. Jan says, haven't eaten out in the last four years due to restaurants serving meals that are too high in sodium. I would like more ideas for low sodium meals. A lot of meals that we eat that I don't, that I make a too high, that I don't make a too high in sodium. We're just used to no salt in our meals. Well, that's great, Jan. Um, if you're used to no salt in your meals and you like it that way, I definitely um, would recommend to keep cooking it that way. It sounds like you're doing great with that. I'm not sure what the question is. Do you mean suggestions for when you eat out or or what there Ginny said i started eating more veggies and healthy grains right from the beginning of my homemade journey my sugar craving stopped in less than a week wow that's incredible 
Um, someone said the old foods aren't as tasty as before. That I want to echo as well. Not only do your cravings change, but sometimes when I do go back to my old staple favorite comfort foods, they don't taste the same anymore. I've heard this from a lot of members too. They go get the burger and they go, oh, this isn't like I remember it being. It's not as good. I find now if I eat potato chips, a lot of the time I find I can taste that the oil is kind of rancid and old and it puts me off. Mm -hmm. So I look for little small boutique chip makers that are, you know, brothers who found the perfect potato chip thing and they sell small packets and you know they've made it in the last week or so instead of sitting on the shelf for a year. So that things really do change. All right, I'm not going to read the amazing um, extra messages um, in here. There's a lot um, here. Diane says, I was a heavy Coca-Cola drinker, minimum three per day. Have not had a regular soft drink in two months. First three days were difficult. Headings, cravings. Now only difficult if I have certain foods, i.e. French fries, hamburger, pizza, so I steer clear of the trigger foods. That's fantastic, Diane. And again, just to echo, um, with the homemade philosophy, um, you can now and then have pizza and French fries or a burger and have a soft drink with it that night and just do it rarely and really enjoy it when you do. So you don't have to be perfect with this approach. All right, let us carry on to tip number three. Um, I think you're going to like this one, which is... Um, do make it delicious. And so when you're talking about fussy eaters, a lot of the time when people don't like healthy food, such as, um, I can't remember who it was who said her husband says healthy is yucky and tasteless. A lot of the time, it's not the healthy food that's bad. It's the way it's been prepared. It's that traditionally we've tried to do this all or nothing thing. So we were eat either eating burger and fries or we were on a diet doing some kind of steamed fish with steamed broccoli which tastes terrible and you don't want to eat that and you don't want to stick to it. So your family starts associating healthy with yucky and bland and flavorless food. So this approach is different because I want you to make most of your meals delicious most of the time. And um, the great news is the simple trick for that is using the exact same science that the fast food and junk food industry uses. And I've no idea why, more people aren't sharing this trick because it's so simple and it's so effective, which is basically using the flavor combining principles we teach in the program, which is add sugar, fat and salt to your cooking. And so to the person who commented saying, I want lower sodium meals, for example, when you cook at home, it's okay to add some fat, whether it's olive oil or butter, it's okay to add some sugar, it's okay to add some salt to your healthy made from scratch food because that's what makes food taste good that's what makes the brain register yum and that's what makes the body register satiety and so you want to be making food delicious so if you're cooking for fussy eaters if you use these same principles they're going to think the food is delicious so with the sodium example when you eat out or you eat fast food or you eat restaurant meals it's so true that it's got so much sodium. They put so much sodium in, they put so much sugar in, they put so much fat in. But when you make it yourself at home, you control what goes into it. You don't need to add much to make it delicious. So use those principles to make the cooking delicious. Um, there's a great book on this called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, Mastering the Elements of Good Cooking by Semin Nosrat. Um, so that's a great book if you want to learn some of those principles and actually the book about the junk food industry making the food addictive it's called um, salt sugar fat how the food giants hooked us by michael moss so that's two resources if you want to check out um, so use those same principles examples of how this works in practice the first one that's a great example is roasting so many of my members come in and they love um the fact that they can take just about any vegetable and it becomes delicious when you roast it. And the reason it's delicious when you roast it is because you add a little bit of oil. That's the fat that makes the brain register yum. You add generally a little bit of salt and actually the roasting process causes the natural sugars in the vegetables to crystallize or caramelize. So you get that natural sweet. So there you go. It's the fat, the salt and the sweet, and that makes the brain go yum. So you can get your vegetables in that way. Another example Angel has already commented is homemade potato chips. It's a great one if your husband or you love potato chips, try making them yourself at home. We normally boil the potato, chop it with the skin on, throw it in the, slice it thinly, um, chop it in the, bleh, my words are all getting <laughs> confused. So boil it up, slice it thinly, 
leave the skin on and then throw it in the oven with some kind of seasoning. Normally I just use something super simple like olive oil and salt, sea salt, but you can add thyme, you can add paprika, you can add rosemary, there's so much, you can add Cajun spices and they taste amazing and they look amazing. And by leaving the skin on, you're getting the benefit of the fiber of the potato and it's nothing like the amount of calories, the amount of sodium or the amount of oil that you'd be getting from buying fries. So that's a great example. Vivian, to answer your question, absolutely homemade pizza is much better than restaurants or frozen because you can add five different types of vegetables on there and you're probably going to use much less cheese than they use and much less processed meats, all of which is high in calories and high in sodium and high in cholesterol too. And you can use a healthier crust such as a whole grain crust or a gluten-free crust if you're celiacs and you're avoiding gluten. So much better. Making it yourself is really um, the first of our principles, of our pillars of how to achieve these results. So step three, tip three is really, if you have fussy eaters in your life or you're a fussy eater, don't think that they just don't like those foods. Think about how you can make them delicious. And in general, the answer is add fat, sugar or salt. And you don't need to add a lot. But if you add a little bit, you get the deliciousness, you get the satiety and you're not reaching for the candy and the chips after dinner. And that's what does all the damage. So that's tip three. And an adjunct to tip three is also keep it simple. Sometimes I see people posting comments in the community group or the members only group about cooking mishaps and I read what they made and I'm thinking that's way too much going on. You know, good cooking, good chefs often just use three to four very simple ingredients. So you don't need to be complicated. So sometimes the reason the food doesn't taste good is because there's just too much going on. So um, share in the chat if you have any suggestions for ways you incorporate those flavor balancing principles um, or keeping it simple in order to make it delicious. So um, take a look at that. Um, you can comment in the chat. I'm loving all the discussion. This is incredible. Um, but I am going to move on to tip number four um, because the time is running. I can see that. Um, so I love your tip though, Anne-Marie, about avoiding overcooking vegetables. That's a classic example of what traditionally we've done wrong, I think, with healthy foods that make people think they're not delicious. And, um, and most veggies taste better raw or lightly cooked or roasted. So that's another great tip. So tip number four is something that um, already Darlene has shared with us. Great tip, which is trying it in multiple ways. And this is probably one of the best tips for dealing with fussy eaters. If they don't like it this way, try it that way. And the good news is they're almost, there's almost infinite options of how you can try the ingredients to make them delicious. So Darlene commented that, okay, with the kale and the spinach, if I don't like to eat it in a salad, I've discovered I can just blend it up in a smoothie and it kind of disappears and you can't taste it or see it and I'm able to get the nourishment that way. That's a great tip. I've got some other ones. So with beets, for example, that was one that a lot of people um, didn't like. You can roast them. They roast really well and it's so simple. Wrap it up in a little bit of aluminum foil, drizzle some salt in there, sorry, some uh, extra virgin olive oil in there, maybe a sprinkle of salt and roast it up. And they taste so good like that. It takes out the bitterness. It really does take out that earthy flavor, darling, that you're not too um, keen on. And it makes them taste very sweet. You can obviously boil them as well with a bit of vinegar, use them in homemade hamburgers. I know members have made... Um, uh, beet chips as well. It's something I've never done, but people rave about that one. Um, someone's saying, can I avoid artificial sugars? I would absolutely recommend it. The artificial sugars, the research shows, just trains your brain to be addicted to sugar. And it's actually cor correlated with having a higher BMI. Um, so I don't recommend that as a strategy. Even if you're hooked on soda, I'm not a big fan of moving to diet soft drinks because there's no studies that show it helps you to lose weight or reduce your blood numbers. It's better to try and wean off them. So I'm seeing the roasted beets coming up a lot. Um, another example is fish. People who don't like fish, very good suggestion for this is buy it really fresh. A lot of the time when people don't like fish, it's because you're buying fish that's a couple of days old and it's got that very strong fishy smell. So if you don't like fish, my suggestion is go to a fishmonger or a supermarket where you know the fish is literally brought in that morning and it hasn't been frozen and defrosted 
multiple times and start perhaps with the white fishes, some of the more mellow flavoured white fishes um, like snapper can work well um, and just be easier for people to tolerate. And I even suggest breading it. A lot of people worry about breading things. Um, I, this, to me, this is one of those inflated concerns that comes out of the dieting industry because honestly when you bread a, a piece of fish um, you're using about a tablespoon of breadcrumbs that's not a big deal especially if they're not deep fried breadcrumbs and you can use a small amount of oil you can add some seasonings in there such as cajun spices paprika you can even use some crushed nuts or almond flour if you want and then add just one or two tablespoons of oil to the pan and it literally looks like a deep fried piece of fish but it's way healthier and you've made it yourself. That's a good way to get um, husbands, kids, grandkids to eat something like fish and they may not even know they're eating fish. I actually tell my two-year-old just about everything is chicken nuggets <laughs> and um, being able to hide things to make it look like chicken nuggets um, has been a big win for us. So there's a little trick there. Um, and another trick with fish that goes a long way is... Um, is adding some butter to the pan when you're cooking it and lots of lemon juice. That goes a long way to making fish delicious as well. So that's a couple of tips for the fish. On the kale, most, um, most of our members um, talk about uh, this trick that I love talking about. Um, it really can change things for you if you don't like kale, um, which is the massage trick. So if you actually chop your kale fine and then you massage it with some olive oil, lemon juice and a sprinkle of salt, um, it takes out the bitterness and oh my gosh, it tastes so good to me. It tastes like flavoured chips. I'm not exaggerating. To me, once I've done that with kale, massaged it with the olive oil and lemon juice and then I add it to the salad bowl and top it with the other things, to me that tastes amazing. And I've heard from probably 90% of my members that that trick helped them like kale. So Good one to try there um, for kale. Mushrooms comes up a lot as something members don't like. My trick there is um, try, try sautéing it with, I was going to use your um, balsamic vinegar trick, Darlene. I find balsamic vinegar kind of brings up, brightens up the flavour of mushrooms and takes out that very kind of earthy, um, earthy sort of, fungus taste that not everyone likes. Anne-Marie, um, the massaging is the key. That's what helps it, um, helps it break down and not feel like you're a rabbit. Um, try the massage thing. It really breaks down the bitterness and the fibres a little bit. Um, yes, oil, lemon, and just the salt is optional. I just find that that is the absolute clincher, adding a little sprinkle of salt there. Um, okay, the next thing, greens in smoothies, Darlene, you stole, stole my trick there. Brussels sprouts, I have a good one. Other than roasting them, try adding a sprinkle of sugar, like brown sugar or coconut sugar. That works really well with Brussels sprouts. And a couple of other things that work really well is small little bacon bits. Um, I know everyone's afraid of things like bacon because it's not healthy and it's definitely not something you want to eat every day. But the key here is if you eat small amounts of bacon now and then, unless you're ethically opposed to eating meat, which I completely respect, but if you're eating small amounts of meat, it's not going to harm you. That's what most of the research shows, that if you're mostly plant-based, having small amounts of meat here and there aren't going to harm you. And if you can add it with a mass of vegetables and your family or you are eating it, you're winning. So one of my tricks, for example, is I'll make a lot of um, homemade soups and then I actually instead of putting the bacon in the soup I fry it in a pan chop it up small and I actually sprinkle on top of the soup so it looks like there's a lot of bacon but there's no bacon in the soup just a sprinkling on top um, and that's the Brussels sprouts as well if you just sprinkle it with a little bit of coconut sugar or some um, uh, bacon bits some roasted nuts that will really turn into a winner on that the cabbage people who didn't like the cabbage my tip there is try eating it raw. Have you tried very thinly sliced cabbage with some roasted peanuts, um, some lime juice? You do need, again, a little bit of coconut sugar or some honey in this mix. Maybe a little drop, few drops of fish sauce or some um, tamari soy sauce. That kind of combination with cabbage, it's a real winner. It comes from Asian countries. They know what they're doing because they're um, flavorings. The reason Asian food tastes so good is they always have the mix of fat, sugar, and salt. And so you can make a cabbage at 
salad at home tastes really good by using those same principles. I like the, uh, the mayonnaise example too with the slaw with the cabbage. Um, my trick with things that need mayonnaise is I often use one part mayonnaise, two parts yogurt. No one ever notices or knows the difference and it still tastes like mayonnaise. You can make a coleslaw with cabbage and then add two parts yogurt to your one part mayonnaise. Um, all right, I'm going to move on um, to some more tips. But the tip here for number four is try in multiple ways. If people in your family don't like it this way, don't force it down their throat. Or if you're fussing and you don't like it, try it a different way. Another great tip with Brussels sprouts. Actually, eight out of ten times that I eat it, I actually just slice it thinly and eat it raw in a salad. That's my favourite way to eat Brussels sprouts above all else. It's, I find it delicious and I love the appearance of it, the little leaves. So you can try some of that. Okay. Um, let us see. So the question about coconut sugar and why it's better, it's simply a low GI sweetener. So it's not going to cause your blood sugars to spike. That's the main reason. There's other sweeteners that are good too. It's all natural. It's got health benefits. It's got minerals in it. Um, there's other sweeteners that aren't bad. You can use a little bit of maple syrup. Honey is very good for your high in antioxidants. It's got antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial properties. The minute someone in our household has a cold or cough coming on, a teaspoon of honey goes in their mouth and we make honey lemon ginger tea from scratch. So um, that's some, another sweetener you could try. All right, so let us continue. Um, that was tip four. Try things in multiple ways. Keep, keep trying it um, because you can get great success there. Diane, about your question about stevia, I generally don't recommend it even though it's all natural and here's why. It's because it has about 100 times the sweetness of sugar and even if you're using small, small amounts um, in your coffee or cooking, you can end up adding the equivalent of 5, 6, 10, 15 teaspoons of sugar and again, it trains your palate and trains your brain to crave those sweet things. So that's a fact, it's a scientific fact, it's not a theory. So that's generally why I prefer things where one teaspoon is one teaspoon, a teaspoon of honey, a teaspoon of maple syrup, a teaspoon of coconut sugar. You are not going to die if you're adding that to your cooking or if you're topping your oatmeal with that or your fruit, it's fine um, and it's sweet and it's delicious, but you're seeing what you're getting, you know, it's more honest, it's more real. So that's my recommendation. If you're eating it with good fruits and vegetables and whole grains, you're not going to get blood sugar spikes. You're not going to get too many calories. Um, similar thing with the monk fruit, Doris. I did answer a question about that in the Q&A thread in the members group too. So check that out. But very similar thing with the monk fruit. Okay. Yes, raw honey is absolutely the best, Sue, for the health benefits. All right. So let's go on. Um, do you have any tips, um, Darlene, that I haven't covered about trying different things in multiple ways in order to get make them delicious? Have there, have there been other things? You've already commented on a few, so you could repeat those, but did anything else spring to mind about different ways you've prepared food that you went, oh, I didn't like it that way, but now I like it? I've just tried to be open to experimenting and seeing what I can get myself to like without it being a punishment. Um, I've tried some things raw, I've tried some things cooked. Part of it is exposure. I mean, mm -hmm. the first it's like it's baby. The first time you put a spoon of whatever in its mouth, it gives you this. What are you trying to do? Kill me? Look. But mm -hmm. if you give it a little bit over a course of time, it develops a taste for it. And so I try to remember that when I'm introducing a new food to myself, to go ahead and give myself several exposures. Acknowledge that it's not my favorite. But, you know, there was a lot of things because when I came out of that household, I didn't eat a whole lot of foods. But over mm. the years, like going to my friends to the pizza parlor, I learned to eat black olives and, you know, all kinds of other mushrooms mm -hmm. and things we just never had at home. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the same thing here is I just keep trying to, to offer myself exposures and things fixed in different ways and allow my, my palate time to adjust and to like them. Absolutely. Fantastic advice there. Um, so the next tip is um, using substitutes that have similar nutritional properties. And so this is another great tip, I think, for fussy eaters or who have a husband who doesn't eat a lot of things or kids or grandkids, which is um, you don't need to eat everything at the end of the day. If you don't like Brussels sprouts, eat cabbage instead. If you don't like um, beets, there's other root vegetables you can try eating instead. Try golden beets. If you don't like fish, eat chicken. So at the end of the day, in order to be healthy, you just need to eat 
the rainbow, eat a variety of nourishing ingredients. And the more you can add new ingredients, definitely, I promise, your body will get more nourishment from it. So if you're just having, you know, lettuce and apples in the house, the more you can introduce more things, you will get more benefits, absolutely. But take it slow. And at the end of the day, if you don't like some things or your husband doesn't, you don't need to eat all of those things, right? So I think that's an overlooked thing, which is, you don't have to eat everything. For example, with kale or bitter greens, such as dandelion greens, just eat spinach or microgreens, which are very mild. Eat baby, um, baby arugula or baby spinach. So you can always find something that will, you will like that's healthy, that has a similar nutritional profile. And you, as I say, you don't need to be a martyr, um, but if you can find different ways to eat it or sneak it in, that's a good technique as well. So that's a really simple one is um, you don't, would anyone like to type in the chat some examples they have of things they don't like, but things that they know have a similar nutritional profile that they've introduced to kind of cover off that base of feeling healthy um, and covering that off. So if there's anything there, um, any, if anyone wants to share any comments there, then type it in the chat. Let's see Jan saying, if you have a lot of protein at lunch, is it counterproductive at dinner? too many calories. The problem with the protein, Jan, is not so much too many calories. There's a lot of very lean proteins. The problem is that a lot of proteins, especially animal-based proteins, can have an acid-forming effect on the body and they can be linked to things like cancers, heart disease, high blood cholesterol. So the problem is not so much the calories or weight gain unless you're eating very fatty meats, which should, which is fine and delicious, but to be really reserved for special treat or rare occasions. It's more that too much protein um, isn't so good for your body. It actually puts a strain on the kidneys. Um, and it's ironic that we have this big craze of Atkins and keto and everyone's saying protein, protein, protein in this massive multi-million dollar industry selling us protein products. Because as one of my um, mentors and advisors to homemade, he's a Stanford professor of medicine, um, in the School of Preventive Health, he's been researching nutrition for 25 years. He always says every doctor or nutritionist he's ever met in his life, he asks them, have you met anybody, anybody ever who's protein deficient? And the answer is always no. So none of us really need more protein. That was pretty much a clever marketing ploy. You can get all the protein you need from plants. You can get protein from oats from whole grains, from beans, from lentils, from tofu. There's so many plant-based sources of protein and you definitely don't need protein supplements to be healthy. If you did eat protein at lunch, there's no real downside to adding it to your dinner, Jan. But I normally try and just eat a balance of things throughout the day. So if I had toast for breakfast, I probably won't have pasta for dinner. But I might have one or either for either meal. If I had steak salad for lunch i probably won't have steak for dinner so just try and eat a spread of things throughout the day um love your suggestion sandy hate peanut butter but use almond butter or cashew butter instead fantastic jackfruit for pulled pork wow that is incredible um don't do citrus fruits but do fresh berries uh broccoli etc and tomato says linda um how much is too much protein so jen they say generally the same number of grams as your body weight um, maybe post this in the questions thread in the, um, in the members group so we can get into it more there. But basically they say a piece of meat should really be the size of the palm of your hand. So most of us are eating way too much meat um, as well. So it sounds like my husband is about to come home with my child. So we'll see how this goes. But you might get a little sneak preview of my two-year-old in a minute. Um, okay, so let's see. So Penny, the, the reason why keto eating plants can be high protein is because generally they suggest cutting out a lot of carbohydrates. So you're eating a lot of fat and you're basically eating a lot of fat and protein and not a lot of carbohydrates, which isn't the ideal balance for the body. The ideal fuel for the body is carbohydrates. That's why we feel good when we eat healthy carbohydrates because that's the preferred energy source for the body. All right, let's go on with the picky eating stuff. Avocado toast with almonds and drizzle of honey is the best. That sounds amazing, Bev. Um, oh, okay. Um, someone's asking, husband likes to avoid beans due to flatulence um, at work, doesn't like the embarrassment. I have a wonderful suggestion for that, which is soaking your beans for one to two days. If you buy them 
as dried beans and you soak them for one to two days, all the bubbles that come up on the surface are actually oligosaccharides, which is the thing that causes flatulence. So by letting it all come up into the water, draining the beans and wash, rinsing them, you can reduce a lot of the farty effect of beans. And also the longer you cook them for, that helps as well. So that's the, that's the suggestion there. All right, let us carry on. So um, I wanted to carry on with the final thing, which is specifically tips for husbands and picky kids and grandkids. And all of these tips will also apply to you as well if you're the fussy eater. But this is just a section dedicated to husbands and picky kids or grandkids. So the first tip here is really think about the appearance of the food. Um, you want it to look delicious. Don't serve them a pile of wilted spinach and steamed broccoli because it's not going to look delicious. But if you serve, um, for example, a piece of steak on top of a pile of wilted spinach, maybe that will look delicious. Or if you serve your steamed broccoli with some chopped up, um, maybe dates, some roasted almonds, maybe some bacon bits or cheese bits, maybe that will look delicious. So work with what um, people like because people eat with their eyes first. Um, and when you're thinking about the appearance of the food, my big tip here is when you're starting out, whether it's you or your husband, make it familiar with a twist. So if your husband loves fried, fried chicken and French fries, if that's a key meal for him, try my little trick of breading it with a little bit of maybe beaten up egg, some breadcrumbs or some almond meal and just kind of sear it in one to two tablespoons of oil in a pan. And then you can make your own homemade French fries as Angel pointed out. Um, and you end up with a meal that looks like his fried chicken and fries, but it's a lot healthier. Um, another example is you can serve his fried chicken and fries, but just start adding a vegetable or a side salad. So it looks very familiar, but you've got the vegetables showing up on the plate and maybe start with some of the more um, start with some of the more familiar vegetables that you know that they like and start to maybe just add in one little thing that's new here and there. So it's really about offer them things that are fami familiar with a twist. Um, another example is you can try the pasta with the zucchini noodles. If you saute those lightly in some olive oil and make a nice homemade tomato sauce, maybe even with some ground beef in there, that kind of looks and tastes a lot like pasta, but you're using the zucchini in there. Zucchini is a great thing. You can sneak into a lot of different meals. Um, the baked chicken breast, Deb, I like the suggestion there. It's a very similar um, suggestion. Um, pizza, someone already raised this. It's a great meal that you can make um, with... Um, a lot healthier if you do it yourself at home. So if you have a family member who loves pizza, you can start off with what they all, let's say pepperoni pizza is their favorite. You can even buy pepperoni, slice it thinly, and then add a few more vegetables underneath and they won't even know it, right? So serve them what they're already familiar with and then start to bring in some new stuff. Another example of what you can do is add a healthy side. So it could be the burger that they're used to, but then you have a healthy side. It could be nachos, but you add extra avocado, extra pico, extra salsa, some different things that are going to add more veggies in the mix. Um, the second tip on top of um, thinking about making it familiar with a twist is thinking about volume. I think this is a really, really key message, which is a lot of the time when people think healthy food is yucky or bland and flavorless, it's got a lot to do with healthy food not being filling and satisfying because they're so used to the diet mentality. They're so used to the history of dieting that it's very entrenched in our minds as eating that it's bland, not tasty, not satisfying, leaves you deprived, you're left wanting the chips. So make it big, make it hearty, make it abundant. And this goes forever. This goes for everyone. I see the biggest mistake new members often make is they're not eating enough and so they end up not getting enough calories and then they get the cravings and they're going for the candy or whatever to get the quick fix. So when you start eating more healthy, more vegetables, they are so low in calories. Um, even fruits are so low in calories. Um, and so you've got to make it hearty. You've got to make it abundant. So to answer the point someone raised about carbs are a problem for diabetics, bad carbs are a problem for diabetics. 
bad carbs are the refined white sugars, the refined white flours. They're high in calories. And when they enter your body and your blood, they spike your blood sugars. Good carbs are the key to reversing diabetes. The good carbs that are full of fiber. And my members have time and time again proven you can eat carbohydrates and bring your blood numbers down. In fact, it's the key to making this way of living and eating sustainable. I see you nodding there, darling. Do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, when I eat white rice, I can only eat a quarter of a cup and it spikes my blood sugars. I've eaten the brown rice and it doesn't touch them. And I can eat a half a cup of it and it didn't shake my blood sugar. Same thing with the fruit smoothies. I put chia seeds in them. I make sure I've got enough fiber in them. It doesn't touch, it doesn't touch it. Yep. That date and walnut. Carry, no, carry on. I was gonna say that date walnut pie, pie crust that we used to make the uh, pumpkin pie at Christmas, quarter of a pie, didn't shake my blood sugar yeah. at all. Yeah. Incredible. And. I would like to add to that also, you're not eating the brown rice on its own. So mm -hmm. you're eating the brown rice with vegetables, with a protein, with some healthy fat. And when you're eating, and same with the smoothies, we're not eating a sugar bomb, sugar bomb smoothie like what you'd buy in a store. We're adding a bit of fruit and then we're adding vegetables, we're adding greens, we're adding chia seeds, flax seeds, psyllium, and all or some healthy fats like almond butter. And all of this results in the good slow release of energy that makes you feel full and satisfied without the blood sugar spike. So that's the key here. Um, but the key message on this point around the tips for fussy eaters or husbands um, is think about the volume and making it abundant and hearty. Don't feed them rabbit food. So if you're talking about salads, my trick is I always put the greens on the bottom I then add some vegetables and then I top it with the good stuff. And I mean the bacon or the chicken or the cheese or the crunchy croutons. So the eye just sees that and goes, this looks amazing. Just today, my lunch was leftover pasta. It was honestly a pretty small serving. And I layered the bottom with kale. Then I chopped up some fresh raw vegetables and then I put the hot pasta on top and it was this huge bowl. And my brain looked and went, I'm having a big bowl of pasta for lunch, but it was actually 90% vegetables just layered with hot pasta on top. And that satisfied me all the way through the afternoon. So um, the key is make it voluminous, make it abundant, make it hearty. Um, layered salads is an example. Sandwiches as well. You can really layer a lot of good stuff in there um, without them really noticing. And you can make it look really big. And then the brain goes, whoa, this is amazing, but it's a lot of veggies in there. It's a lot of greens. It's a lot of beets, or I don't want to say the beets and the mushrooms that everyone doesn't like, but they're all on our minds because everyone's talking about them. There's a million different vegetables like cucumber and um, um, my gosh, I'm drawing such blanks today. What are those things? Bell peppers. <laughs> they're in my fridge right now. So there's a ton of things you can add. Avocado. Um, then the other example of making abundant, hearty, hearty food is, um, is stews and casseroles. And casseroles are great because you can make it with the stuff they're already used to, that they already like, such as um, meat and potatoes. And then you can sneak a lot of stuff in there that they won't notice. It kind of just gets lost in the, in the mix. Um, and so you can add so many different things in there. You can use a grain base or a pasta base. You can use whole wheat pasta instead of white pasta. That's a nice little trick where you get more fiber in there and no one will ever notice. Um, and then adding in um, other vegetables in the mix um, that kind of just get mixed in, cooked in. I actually love the example of adding greens to soups and stews and casseroles. You can add half a bag and it completely melts in the mix and you can't really see it or notice it um, and you can just eat that. So let's see some of the comments here. Um, egg sandwiches have become a whole new experience with avocado, peppers, cucumbers and squash cooked in the eggs or added on the bread. Great example, Bev. I love the example when I cook myself a breakfast and I think to myself, hmm, I'm having an egg. It's a delicious egg sandwich for breakfast. But if I had have gone out to eat, this would have been four slices of bread. This would have been probably three eggs fried in some kind of um, amazing amounts of oil, served with bacon and no goodness. Whereas I'm sitting here having one or two pieces of whole grain bread with one or two eggs and then the tons of spinach and avocado and 
uh, tomato and cucumber and it's a lot of fresh raw veggies and a lot of goodness along with the egg which normally I will hard boil it or poach it as well instead of frying it so it makes a big difference when you prepare it yourself at home I love the example Paul says spinach is great on sandwiches um, sprouts are great um, eggs with salsa and cheese awesome examples so Diane about the cheese um, cheese is just one of those things I totally love cheese we have cheese in our household they generally recommend about one ounce or less per serve. That's another example where if you eat out, you're gonna get much more cheese than that on your pizza. So use cheese, use it as something that's delicious. It's a topping, um, it's to be eaten more sparingly simply because potentially it does have that saturated fat that can contribute to increasing high blood cholesterol, um, potentially contribute to cancers or heart disease. So it's one of those things, just use it sparingly and enjoy it, you know? Um, so that's the, the comment there. The third tip um, for the husbands, kids, grandkids is sneaking it in. And we haven't talked about this much today, but it's definitely a winner that a lot of my members use. I know Darlene used it. Her mother used it. Cauliflower can be your best friend for this. Cauliflower is so healthy. Um, you may not think so because it's white and we all think that white foods aren't healthy for us, but you can have, um, you can have, Cauliflower is actually a cruciferous vegetable and the cruciferous vegetables group is one of the best cancer preventative food groups. So great to include. So you can chop up cauliflower, you can mix it in with mashed potato, you can use cauliflower rice, um, you can add it, um, blend it up into things and just add it in there and they won't even know, it, know it's in there. So any suggestions here? Someone suggested homemade mac and cheese, adding some cauliflower in the mix that they don't notice. Um, some other things you can sneak in. The smoothies are such a winner. Just this morning, I made one of the cacao ones. I felt like a delicious one. It was banana, cacao, cacao nibs. I used my flax psyllium chia mix. And then I just threw in um, a bit of parsley, carrot and cucumber raw, blended up the whole thing with frozen banana and some almond milk. And I actually finished the whole smoothie before I even remembered that I had the veggies in there and the herbs in there. So. Smoothies are great for sneaking in uh, vegetables. My big tip is if you're adding greens, don't make a red smoothie because then you get that yucky brown color. So if you're using greens, I recommend either making a really green smoothie or making one with blueberries or blackberries to give it that kind of purple color. So um, burgers, great place. Burgers and bolognese, that's a great place to sneak in vegetables. I always make our homemade burgers with ground grated zucchini or carrot in there and no one has ever noticed or commented on it you can do the same with bolognese sauce you can sneak in a lot of vegetables there um, the blender or a food processor is also a great place to sneak in vegetables um, i'm hearing meatloaf there cashew cream with steamed cauliflower crustless quiche um, spaghetti squash cauliflower pizza crust um, these are fantastic tips coming through. Keep the tips coming through of things you sneak in um, to your um, family's food that they haven't noticed that you do. Jan saying, haven't had any luck finding psyllium. Have you tried looking on Amazon and buying it online? Um, I normally find it in normal health food stores and it's great because it's probably about $20, but it lasts me for at least three to four months normally. I just I just put um, the psyllium mix with the flax and chia in a jar and it just lasts forever. So try it online, Jan, if you don't have any luck. Um, but keep typing in your suggestions of things you've snuck in um, that your family haven't noticed. Um, so the other trick we've got here is changing up your flours. All of my family's pancakes, we use buckwheat flour or whole wheat flour. Practically, whenever we eat pasta, it's always whole wheat pasta. Most of the rice is brown rice. I find this easy to do because I actually like all of those better, except for the pasta. I will say every now and then I buy the white pasta because I just find it's different and it's better. Um, but when I make white pasta, I'm using a lot of vegetables always my pastas are always two thirds vegetables, one third pasta. So the vegetables mean you don't get the blood sugar spikes because you're getting that good slow release energy and a lot of fiber. So um, let's see what else we're sneaking in. Blending the veggies. Blending the veggies is fantastic. You can, you can sneak a lot in that way, including um, a lot of our soups. Um, funny story, my two and a half year old obviously loves French fries. And um, I made the other day cauliflower potato soup for dinner. Um, with also zucchini in it um, and I told her it was french fries soup 
And she sat down and she goes, where are the French fries? And I said, they're in the soup. <laughs> and she ate it and she had three bowls. It was amazing. Um, so pretty funny. Sneaking beets into everything. Beets are actually something good you can blend in and they disappear. Love the trip, Oksana, about turkey quinoa chili. Quinoa is good in casseroles. You can sneak it in there. That's a good, um, good tip. Yeah, mixing the um, whole wheat and white pasta is fantastic. No, I'm not lying to my child. I never lie to my child. I actually have a huge philosophy about, about not lying to my child, but it's the same. She actually calls them papas because she's learning Spanish. And it's the same, the same thing. It's, it's literally potato in a soup. Um, so I consider that not lying. I never lie to my kids or anybody else. I have a big philosophy against that. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, Rita says, just kidding. Um, okay. Carolyn here says, have to be careful with wheat um, due to allergies. So difficult when it comes to breads, flowers, and so much more. Carolyn, you can get tons of support in our members group about that because a lot of our members have got issues with wheat and gluten intol intolerance. So feel free to post in the members group or the community group, and I'm sure we can give you tons of good suggestions on that. Um, wow, a slice of pumpkin without the American pie spices, delicious with fried egg. That's amazing breakfast. I've never had that breakfast in Australia myself. Oat flour is a good suggestion. Um, there's a lot of things you can do instead of wheat as well. Com members have commented on the rice. Um, but yeah, feel free to post that in the group. So that's some suggestions. Another one about sneaking it in. Green bell pepper is simple. Cauliflower, um, sweet potato substituting for potato. Um, celery thinly sliced and cooked they're all very mild and you can start sneaking them in so the final tip is persevere and this is a really important thing to bear in mind that repetition makes it the new norm so the first time you buy the smaller bag of chips for your household the first time your husband has a side of salad with his burger or whatever it is with his um, fish and you know fish and chips or his Chicken, chicken and fries, um, he might be up in arms about it or he might not touch it. But over time, if you repeat it, I always say to my members, at first your family will protest, then they'll come to accept it, and then they will come to expect it, and they will actually complain if you don't provide it. So really, and it's the same with you, what used to be normal changes over time. I gave the example um, in the last workshop I used to always buy the gallon tubs of ice cream. Now I never buy anything other than the pint tubs and I buy the expensive good stuff and it lasts longer and we eat less of it because it's, it's better and it tastes better. It's better quality. But I realized there's no point buying a gallon of ice cream because we're just going to eat it if it's in the fridge. So the same thing with the vegetables. At first you start off with a huge plate of pasta is the norm with a little bit of meat sauce or vegetable sauce. And then over time it becomes a smaller amount of pasta and a lot of vegetables sauce with a little bit of meat. So really um, changing progress, not perfection is the goal. People don't make changes overnight. Um, and even if you start with one, two, three healthy meals a week, you're gonna be retraining everyone's palates and getting the benefits. So let me recap on the points. Um, and then we'll do Q&A and anyone who needs to take off can do so. But one quick point, reader, about the frozen yogurt. Um, I, I warn my members against things like frozen yogurt. It's one of those foods that I call junk food masquerading as health food because often it's high in sugar. Even if it says no added sugar, they add things like grape juice extract, apple juice extract, or just fruit, a lot of fruit. So you're getting a lot of sugar in there. And if it's no added sugar and it's low in sugar, they're often using artificial sweeteners or natural sweeteners. Either way, it's either high in calories, high in sugar or high in fake sugar. And it's training your brain to be addicted to these sugary things. So it's one of those foods that I would say, there's nothing wrong with frozen yogurt. There's nothing wrong with store-bought granola. There's nothing wrong with anything um, is our philosophy. Just buy them now and then and realize that it's a treat. That's all it is. Frozen yogurt's a treat, ice cream's a treat, you know, um, roasted, uh, uh, a packet of potato chips is a treat and so is a packet of those things that they're selling us now like um, sweet potato fries or those popcorn things. They're all treat foods. They're not staples. Um, so I hope that helps. So for dessert, we have an entire module on dessert, Deb. Um, so I, I, we can come back to that question. That's a great, um, great question 
question. Let me, let me, um, it's a treat. And sometimes I need a treat, Jan. And sometimes I want to have ice cream and sometimes I want to have chips and sometimes I might have frozen yogurt. Just if I'm having frozen yogurt, I don't kid myself anymore like I used to, that that's a healthy thing. I know it's a treat, right? So that's the shift. Um, okay, so to quickly recap, um, tip number one is mindset is everything. You gotta always come back to why are you doing this, your big why. Um, don't be a princess, don't be a martyr either. Make most of your food delicious, but not every single thing has to be amazing that you eat. Um, and also, don't be a five-year-old. So if you want everything, you can't have it. I always like to say, you can eat anything, you just can't eat everything. <laughs> and so if you want to eat something, um, be a mother to yourself, be loving, be nurturing, be patient. Um, don't be judgmental, but steer yourself in the right direction. You can do it. That's how it works. And if it's your husband or a family member who's a picky eater, try to talk to their values because that's one of the biggest things that people will resonate with is if you can find a value that works, you can just come back to that over and over again. It really, really works. People live their life based on their values. So that's a big one. So what, num, tip one is mindset. Tip two is about retraining your palate. If you're a fussy eater or you don't like a lot of foods or a family member is, a lot of the time it's just because you've trained your palate that way or you haven't been exposed to the foods. So the two tips for retraining your palate is number one, try and limit your exposure to junk food because our brain is wired to be addicted to junk food. They scientifically engineer it that way. And so don't go cold turkey. It's probably not going to work. Just try and buy smaller packets, have it around less. And then tip two under that one is just bring more of the good stuff in, the whole natural foods, the fruits, the vegetables, the grains, the nuts, the seeds. And the more you eat that stuff, the more you will reset your palate, your cravings will reduce um, and you will start to like and crave more of the good stuff. I guarantee it. it's amazing how quickly that can happen. Um, tip three is do make it delicious. You can use the same exact principles that the junk food um, and processed food industries use to make junk food tasty, to make healthy food tasty. And the key is simple, fat, sugar, and salt. Use it in your cooking and it will make it taste good. Don't be afraid to cook with fat, sugar, and salt. You don't need a lot. And I guarantee you're going to be using 10 times less than the restaurants and junk food and fast foods use. So that's a great tip. Make it delicious and keep it simple. Tip number four is try it in multiple ways and keep an open mind as Darlene said. So if you don't like it this way, try it this way. If you don't like it this way, try it this way. Keep trying. Eventually, you will find a way that you like it and just keep going and you will get there. Um, tip number five is on the other hand, you don't need to eat everything. You don't need to like everything. So if you've tried and tried and tried and you just don't like it, then really just think about eating a rainbow, eat a wide range of nourishing ingredients and look for things that have similar nutritional properties. So for example, the purple of beet is because it's high in antioxidants. So guess what? You can get those same antioxidants by eating berries with a purple hue or strawberries, which have that same sort of coloring and you get those antioxidants. So that's tip five. You don't have to like everything. Look for substitutes with a similar nutritional value and then come back to it because your palate will change. What you didn't like three months ago might be different in three months time. And then the last special section tips for husbands and family members was make it familiar with a twist. Serve them up what they already know and like and just make a small little tiny change. That's how you bring them along without them kicking and screaming. Um, the next tip was make it big and voluminous so it doesn't look like rabbit food. And that goes for you and it goes for your family members as well. If it looks big and it looks delicious, they're going to have a bigger chance of wanting to eat it. And the last tip there was just sneak it in. There's nothing wrong with this. Find bland, simple vegetables, um, find new flavours and just try and add it in the mix. Smoothies are great, soups are great, casseroles are great, stews are great, um, cauliflower is great, blend it in with the mac and cheese or blend it in um, into mashed potato. And so just start adding it in the mix and their palate will be getting the benefits even if they don't know they're eating it. Um, and the last final tip, tip number five, was just repetition truly will make this the new norm. I can guarantee that if you present this to your family or to yourself 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, 100 times, your conception of normal will change. It absolutely will. So if you're not convinced and you're not sure, just do it like a robot. Be a mother because you're doing what you know is good for you and do it again and again and again and suddenly you'll go, huh, I just did that without even thinking about it.
and it wasn't hard to do. And that will happen over time. And over time, as your um, palette changes, you will start to get those results. So very, very delighted to have you all here. Thank you so much, ladies, for sharing all of your kind words. Um, lots of thank yous for Darlene. Thank you, Darlene and Anna says Sue. Jan says, thank you, darling, for your time. Linda, this will be shared as a replay so you can watch it oh, again. Um, Kathy says, thank you so much for having this second showing for us who missed the first one. Great suggestions. Everything you're teaching is wonderful. Thanks to darling for sharing her story. So brave she's being a guest speaker. Yes, big round of applause for darling. Thanks for coming on a second time. Very much appreciate it. Jan says, you're an inspiration. Bev says, thank you. Anna and Darlene. Oksana says, such great tips. tips. Thank you. Judy says, the cookbook Baby Let's Eat um, is a wonderful source on how to feed your baby child wholesome meals and snacks the entire family can enjoy. It has complete nutritional guidelines for children aged six months to three years. I used it with my daughter. She's now 22 years old and pretty much eats any healthy foods I cook for her. That's a fantastic tip. And I have another book like that called Real Food for Mother and Baby. And it talks about pregnancy and new children and what to feed them. So thanks for sharing that. Linda says, thank you, darling, for your time and suggestions. Keep up the good work. Thank you too, Linda. Well, thank you so much for coming, ladies. Are there any questions before? Oh, there's about 50 other comments. Thank you, girls. Um, Ginny says, appreciate all your work. It's so great to know that this is a program that works for real people. Um, thank you, darling. Uh, a million, a million things there. Um, oh, Bev says, Anna, you've changed my life. Love all you too. So happy to have you all here. Okay. There's about 50 other messages. So before we go, any other questions? We've definitely answered a bunch of, um, questions as uh, Anna, you're a lifesaver. Angel, you did it all yourself. And Cindy, yes, there will be a replay. So I'll be sending that out. Any other questions? Kombucha tea, um, Valerie, are you brewing it yourself or buying it? Um, kombucha obviously has those probiotics that's very beneficial for your gut health. And the more research that's coming out on the gut microbiome is showing that it's 100,000 times more beneficial to our overall health and well-being and disease protection than we ever thought possible in the past. So eating those beneficial probiotics and prebiotics um, is essential for good health. Um, so I would say it's a good thing. Um, just look at the sugar, make sure it doesn't have too much sugar on it. It can be expensive, so it's not the only way you can get those probiotics. You can get them from pickled vegetables. Um, you can get them from miso soup. You can get them from sauerkraut. So that's some other example of probiotics. Um, Someone, Lorna said, did Darlene eat her anchovies? <laughs> What's the answer, Darlene? They're still looking with their little beady eyes at me every time <laughs> I pull out the fixing to make my salad dressing. Well, that could be a food that you like, I'm just not going to eat anchovies and that's okay. But I will say... No, if, I'll try them. I just yeah, haven't gotten there. If you blend it in, you really can't taste it. It's quite amazing. It gives it a lovely tart flavor. Maureen says, is low sodium canned beans bad if you're in a hurry? Absolutely not. A core part of our philosophy is it's got to be quick and it's got to be easy. So there's not, I always have three or four different cans in my cupboard. I always have one or two cans of some kind of beans or garbanzo beans. I always have some kind of cans of tomatoes. And I always have some kind of cans of um, uh, light coconut milk. And I have those because those are three pantry staple meals that if I'm in a hurry, I know I can make a bean salad or a chili for my family. I know I can make a pasta dinner and I know I can make um, some kind of curry. And those are meals that I can then make with any vegetables in my refrigerator, any meats in my refrigerator. So those are like my pantry SOS meals. Um, so definitely not a bad thing. So don't try and be perfect. Aim for uh, as close, do the best you can from where you are with what you've got is our philosophy. Um, and if you just stick with it, you will make progress. Um, Lee says, Darlene, thank you. Keep up the good work. Jan says, I'll keep chugging along. Do it. You can do it. Um, Oksana says, I make my own water kefir. Well, that sounds amazing. Stick with it. That sounds great. Jan is focused. Um, oh, I like this. Angel says, what do I need to do to portobello mushrooms before I cook them? Nothing. You can cook them as they are. Um, you can roast them in the oven. One of the things I love to do with mushrooms when I roast them is add a little bit of um, goat's cheese or some kind of tart cheese like that, like feta. And I find it really the, the saltiness and a little bit of oil and liquid that goes in just makes them taste amazing. Um, but often I just slice them and then saute them in a pan with some garlic and onion and maybe some 
uh, tomatoes and then use them to make a sauce like that. Sometimes I do peel them. I only really peel them if they're a little bit old. And the way you can tell if portobello mushrooms are fresh or old is by looking at the gills. They actually have gills on the underside and if they're all open, it means they're really fresh. And if it's kind of closed in, it means it's a little bit less fresh, then I sometimes peel them. Um, so that's the tip there. And you generally shouldn't wash mushrooms. Just use a serviette or a napkin or a dishcloth to kind of wipe the dirt off the outside. Um, Great, Bev says homebrew kombucha is great because you flavor it yourself. Um, ooh, um, Anne-Marie says, how do you address cravings in pregnancy? Know some people that our cravings are out of control. You know, my tip there is during both of my pregnancies, I got cravings and I also said, I'm not gonna use this as an excuse to eat unhealthy. And I did, um, yes, I did indulge more than I normally do because honestly, there were times when all I wanted to eat was premium crackers or carbohydrates and that's all my body wanted. And I said, you know what? I just have to listen to my body and trust my body. Um, so to some extent you go with it, but I didn't have chips and junk and crap very often because I knew that's just, it can be a bit of an excuse. I think that we go, we're pregnant. I'm having a craving. I'd better eat McDonald's again. I don't think that's, um, I think it can be a real thing. I think those cravings can be real. But what I would normally do is say, okay, I'm craving McDonald's. What's another way I can, what am I really craving? What can I satisfy that with instead? And I found normally there was a healthier option. Um, and I definitely recommend one of the biggest things with pregnancy is just keep eating often and a lot and, a more, and more than you want. Because often those cravings and the nausea happens because you're not eating enough. Um, so that's a tip there and it's difficult. I personally was nauseous and sick for the first four months of both of my pregnancies, So it was hard to eat, um, hard to eat good food, but I kind of made myself do it. So post that in one of the groups if you want more information. I know that's a bit of a, an overhead question, um, but my general tip is just try to look for something that's the healthier version of what they're really craving um, and keep eating often and a lot. So there you go. Thanks, Joyce, for joining us. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, is frozen eight ounce a regular cup of yogurt better than frozen yogurt? So actually, regular general natural plain yogurt is awesome. It has no added sugar, and I think it's a staple for good health. It's one of the things I always have in my fridge. So you can have a cup of yogurt anytime. It's so good for you. And if you want to sweeten it, I recommend you stir in some berries, top it with berries. You can top it with a bit of dried fruit. You can even drizzle it with honey, um, maybe stir in some coconut sugar. I do that sometimes for my daughter um, with some berries mashed in. Um, it's just the flavored yogurts and the flavored frozen yogurt that is super sugary generally. They're the ones to be clear of. Um, awesome. P pantry staple recipes, Jan, will do. Um, thanks for the request. Um, oh, hard boiled eggs with anchovies on top. Not bad. Good, Kim. That sounds great. Um, Saffron is good for your hair. Um, good. Um, Carolyn says, thanks for all the good advice and keeping us healthy. Um, a potato is healthy if you're craving carbs. Okay. So Maureen, um, my tip, the three staples for the pantry candy were, I always have some kind of tinned beans so I can make chili or a salad, which is going to have a healthy protein. And beans are amazing for blood sugars and for reducing high blood cholesterol if that's a problem for you. I always have some coconut milk so I can make some kind of vegetable curry and I always have some kind of tinned tomatoes so I can make some kind of pasta. So are potatoes healthy if you're craving carbs? Um, they're not bad and it depends on whether you're diabetic. If you are gonna have potatoes, my suggestion is leave the skin on um, and then serve them with a lot of vegetables or maybe um, some kind of protein and that can hit the spot for carbs. I wouldn't recommend, you know, eating fries or even making homemade potato fries in the oven all the time and doing that every day. But if you do that a couple of times a week because you're having a craving, that is a great solution. And if you're coming off the back of eating a lot of fast food or eating a lot of potato chips and you start eating homemade potatoes instead, you're going to be winning, you're going to be losing weight, you're going to be getting benefits. And over time, you can just start adding more veggies in the mix. So hope that helps. Let me know if you have a follow-up question. Um, here's Kelly. Any tips for cooking and cutting up cauliflower so it doesn't stink so much? That's a big part of the turnoff for me. I don't find cauliflower stinks and I like it. So does anyone have any tips there um, about that? Oksana says, is maple syrup good? Um, maple syrup 
people like it because it has beneficial um, minerals in it. That's why it's a bit better than white sugar, which is completely refined and has all the minerals removed. Um, it's one of those things I actually rarely buy because it's one of those things that I can stand in the cupboard and just drink maple syrup. I love the flavor of maple syrup. So I don't really buy um, maple syrup that much for my household because when I have it, I'll add it to things too often and I'll use too much of it, which I don't with other sweeteners like honey. So it's up to you. If you want to use maple syrup as a sweetener and you're not going to eat too much of it, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's still liquid sugar. So it's still going to spike your blood sugar. It doesn't have the fiber um, and it still has the calories. But if you're using a teaspoon here and there in your cooking, um, I think that's completely fine and legitimate. So I hope that helps. Honey is wonderful, Maureen, especially because it um, has the antiviral, antibacterial, uh, antifungal properties, um, especially the raw honey is really good for you. And someone mentioned Manuka honey, which is really powerful in all of those properties I mentioned. So honey is very, very powerful superfood. Um, okay. Well, I want to let you all go um, because you've been here a while and I know it's late and I love Sue's final suggestion, drizzle maple syrup on my oatmeal and raspberries every morning. Amen. That's a fantastic suggestion. So just before we go, um, a quick reminder for those of you who are interested in learning more about our program, the wait list is at um, www, I'll type it in the chat, uh, life-changing.homemade-cooking.com. Um, that's where we do all of this magic. And um, I think I got the URL right. Let me know if that's wrong. That's how you can get on the wait list. Last I checked, we had about 1160 ladies on there and there's about 300 spots. And it's the first time we've opened enrollment to our list in a year. So if you're interested, I definitely recommend getting on the wait list for priority enrollment before everybody else. And otherwise, ladies who are in the program, I'm so proud of you. I'm so excited for you. I'm so glad that you're doing this for yourself and i know you can do this everyone's journey is different i guarantee not everyone will lose the same amount of weight not i've had members whose blood sugars went from very high to the normal ranges but their cholesterol is still high i've had members whose cholesterol and triglycerides and liver enzymes normalized but they still needed to work on their diabetes numbers i've had members who dropped a lot of weight but they still need to work on other issues they're having. Some members don't lose any weight, but they're feeling a lot better and their clothes are looser. So stick with it. Do it at your pace. Sometimes life gets in the way and the number one predictor of your success in this program is just stick with it. Um, so before we go, Darlene, any final words to the ladies who are watching? What would you say to them that could maybe help them get on the right path, get some of the results you've been um, getting? Do you have any final wisdom or advice for them? Yes, go to the spice module, watch that, and apply it to your salad dressing. Ooh. Changing how I did my, si my salad dressing made the salads go from eh, which I, and I like salads, or wanting to use the, the store-bought salad, to really going, oh man, this is awesome, and I made it myself. And I can make it fresh right on top of the salad. It's using Unami, and it's using the principles that you teach in that, and applying it to the salad dressing it made all the difference in the world to make the salads taste good. This is why I love having Darlene on. She's got such wonderful advice. She's such a fantastic co-host because that is so, so key actually on this fussy eating topic. If your family doesn't like the salads or the vegetables you're cooking, the dressing is a great place to look. And since once you start making your own salad dressings from scratch, you'll discover it takes minutes to do. You can make 10, 20, 30 serves of it that lasts for weeks in minutes and you will never go back to buying the store-bought ones which are mainly so sugary and so I find them unappetizing anymore. I actually struggle. Sometimes I want a cheat option and I try and find a good salad dressing in the store and I struggle to find one that I like as much as the homemade ones. So fantastic tip and the flavor profiles are infinite on what you can do. You can do a ginger miso one. You can do a Caesar one. You can do a thyme and lemon one. You can do an orange um, mustard one. Um, and the simplest one that I do 90% of the time is just olive oil, lemon juice. And that's basically it. Maybe a little bit of salt, maybe some fresh or dried herbs in there. And it's just beautiful. So fantastic. Yes, my go-to salad dressing is the same as yours too, Lee. Um, and Rita, yes, she said spice. So thank you so much, ladies, for being here. This has been so wonderful to have this time with you. Um, 
thanks for coming. The replay will be sent out. Um, all the best to you. Post in the members group or the community group if you have any follow-up questions. And a huge thank you to Darlene for sharing your time and your wisdom and your inspiring story with us. And I look forward to doing our five-year uh, anniversary with you when you've lost the extra 100, 150 pounds and you can share your amazing story then. No, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. Bye now. Bye. Bye.